Hey, Cassidy. Hi. Uh, are you one of the people that's mad at me? No, I did not know that we were mad at you. <laughs> okay, then you obviously don't have me for lab. No, I have um, Professor Moore for lab. Uh, what happened was I went, over on, I went over how to do a notebook in my first Zoom meeting in the lab. I thought I had saved it, and apparently I didn't. So as a oh. consequence, it's been four weeks now or so. So th th this is the first time I've had a chance to grade the notebooks. A lot of people weren't doing it like I want, so I have to go redo that tonight. Yeah, oh gosh, I'm sorry, that's stressful. Oh, that's not as bad. My uh, my face-to-face -face classes, um, I now have, uh, let's see, in my one class, two people that have tested positive for COVID over oh, in HCC, and in my other class, one. Oh my gosh, that's scary. Eh, what are you going to do? You know, supposedly, supposedly, if you uh, are six feet away and you're wearing masks, it shouldn't matter. I think we're going to have a very, very limited class today, guys. So that's good and it's bad. It's bad because that means I get to call on you individually. It's good because I get to see that you know this stuff. Okay. Anybody have any questions about stoichiometry? Anything, guys? Three-step process, guys. Three-step process. Find the moles of your known material. You're generally given grams, molarity and volume, or you're given the, the quantities to do a gas law. We're gonna do those two subjects in the next two, uh, next week or so. So we're gonna learn about solutions on Thursday. We're gonna learn about gas laws on starting next Tuesday. All of those are tools you can put in your belt to learn how to get moles, okay? So the first thing is getting moles. Right now you have two ways of getting moles, and that is dividing, by, dividing the grams you're given by the molecular weight, or if you're given the volume of a gas at STP, dividing that volume by 22.414, okay? So the first step, turn the, turn the known into moles of known. Then you look at the balanced chemical equation. You look at the balanced chemical equation and you realize that there is a molar ratio in there between your known material and your unknown, okay? Because there is this molar ratio, you can turn your moles of known into moles of unknown. Then finally, finally, you're gonna have your moles of unknown. You're gonna to need to turn that into what the question is asking for. If you have moles of your unknown and you know the volume, you can get the concentration. If you have moles of unknown and you have the uh, um, formula, you can get the weight. So. It's all a simple process, three simple steps. Are we good with that? We're fairly solid on that? Yay, nay? Yes. Are we good, guys? Okay, so I don't know what I'm sharing right now. What, what are you seeing on the screen? It's a slide for a limiting reagent. Okay, and I don't know where that's at, so I'm gonna have to stop it for a second, then I'm gonna have to share the screen again. Um, so it's this, it was this slide, right? Yes. Thank you, Cassidy, right? Yeah. I mean, you think it's hard enough recognizing people's name and faces when you see them. Try doing it from voice recognition. Yeah, it's pretty. Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's pretty impressive, honestly. <laughs> well, there's three of you out there. Now there's four. True. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now that I got you, Cassidy. All right, you remember my res recipe for fantastic apple tarts? You remember that? Um, I actually missed the zooms for stoichiometry last week. Okay, not, not a problem, okay? What happens when we're doing, uh, when we're making a recipe? If I wanna make 14 apple tarts, 
This means I'm going to need four cups of flour, three cups of apples, one cup of sugar, and a tenth of a cup of spices. Now, when you're going to make your apple tarts, Cassidy, if you go there and you only have two cups of flour, can you make 14 apple tarts? Yes. The recipe calls for- Wait, No, no, sorry, no. Okay, so you can't make them. How many can you make, Cassidy? Um, seven. If you have all the other ingredients, you can make seven of them. And basically what you're saying is that you are limited by the amount of flour you have. Chemistry works the same way. If I have two amounts of my reagents, unless they're exactly perfect, one is gonna limit how much the other can produce. That makes sense, guys. Yes. That makes sense to you. Okay, so if I only have two cups of flour, how many extra apples do I have, Jasmina? Uh, 1.5. 1.5. I can only make half the recipe. This means I'm only using half the apples. And Jessica, you out there, Jessica? Yes. Okay, Jessica, if I have only two cups of flour, how many cups of sugar do I have left over? Um. My whole recipe calls for one cup of sugar. Mm -hmm. But I only have half as much flour as I need. How much of the sugar am I going to use up? Half of it. Point half five. of it. So I'm going to have, I'm going to use half my cup of sugar. I'm going to have half my cup of sugar left. Is this kind of making sense to you guys? Yeah. So this is what we're doing today. We're learning about limited reagent problems and we're learning about how much excess you have when you're dealing with a limiting reagent problem. Okay. So I have 5.62 grams of calcium chloride and I have 5.23 grams of silver nitrate. How much silver chloride can I make? First thing guys, First thing you have to realize, okay? I'm mixing calcium chloride and silver nitrate, two ionic reactions, I'm doing a double displacement, and it's asking me how much silver chloride. So I'm putting together two reagents. First thing about a problem is recognition on what type of problem it is. If you are given two amounts of reagents. That dictates that it is a limited reagent problem. Make sense? I'm not saying anything that you are unfamiliar with yet, am I? I'm hearing crickets. Okay, hearing crickets, I'm gonna go on. When you see a problem, that lists two of the reagents, that, that lists amounts of two of the reagents. You have to recognize it is a limited reagent problem. There are various ways to do limited reagent problems. I'm gonna show you one now, and when I do the excess reagent, I'm gonna show you another. But for right now, we're gonna stick with one path. What you do is you predict how much your one reagent, how much of one product your one reagent will make, your one reactant will make. Then you go and you pick the second re reactant and you determine how much of that same product you, that reagent will make. Then basically you look at how much both products make, or both reactants make and you choose the smaller. The smaller one came from the limiting reagent. The smaller one is the one that you report out. 
Are we good with that, guys? That's our strategy behind doing these problems. Yes. Is anybody, is anybody unfamiliar with what I'm talking about now? Okay. Um, got half of my ears out. Okay. Now, sometimes you can look at the problem. Would it do me any good to figure out to, for the product that I choose, would it do me any good to choose calcium nitrate? I can figure out the limiting reagent based on picking calcium nitrate as my product. But then I'd still have to go back and do the calculation for the silver chloride. So the problem I'm giving you here is dictating which product I want you to choose to make. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Thank you for my designated yeah person. Okay, so first step, I got to write the reaction. I got calcium chloride and silver nitrate. Calcium chloride, is that balanced, guys? The calcium, calcium chloride. Go ahead. The quicker you can answer me, the quicker we get through this and more I can get through, guys. Calcium chloride, is that the correct formula for calcium chloride? Um, let me just double check. This should be CaCl2. CaCl2. How about the AgNO3? Um, I don't know silver's charge. Plus one. Oh, then that one should be fine. Okay. If uh, then let's go on to the calcium nitrate. That should um, have parentheses around the nitrate and then a two. And the silver chloride? That should be Ag2CO. Oh, wait, no. That's good. That's good. Okay. Guys, you should be able to realize that that quickly. If you can't realize it that quickly, then you got to go back and restudy how to balance chemicals because you got to get this stuff down. Okay, now we got to balance the, balance the equation. I got CaCl2 plus how many H, or sorry, how many nitrates do I have on the left side? One. How many do I have on the right? Two. What goes in front of the AgNO3? Two. Okay. All right, that gives me, I'm uh, oh, sorry, how many chlorides do I have on the left? Two. How many do I have on the right? One, so put a two in front of it. So guys, that quickly, that quickly is how, how quickly you should go from what's given to the chemical equation. You need to get this, you need to become facile about going from one step to the other. Now, we have our balanced chemical equation. We also have our weights. What's the first step in any stoichiometric problem? Convert grams to moles, right? Gabe? Does it convert grams to moles? Convert grams to moles. So I got that much calcium chloride. Uh, my molecular weight of calcium chloride is 110.98. .9 my grams of silver nitrate, the weight of silver nitrate is 169.88. I got 0 0.0506 moles of calcium chloride, 0 0.0308 moles of silver chloride or silver nitrate. Can I make my determination a limiting reagent right now? Yes. No, wait, you can't. You can't. You can't because you have to deal with the molar ratio. You have to figure out how much product you make. Everybody on that with me? So right now it looks like the calcium chloride is winning, right? So I'm going to imply, I'm going to use my, my, uh, 
molecular ratios, and lo and behold, guys, the calcium chloride is the most because I multiplied it by the molar ratio and I came out with 0.101 moles of silver chloride. Uh, there was a two to two ratio between silver nitrate and silver chloride. So this came up with 0.0308 moles of silver chloride. Which one's smaller, guys? The um, silver nitrate. 0 0.0308 is small. Yeah, no. I'm an idiot. Yes, you are absolutely correct. Let's all repeat ourselves. Mr. Popovich is an idiot. Yes, 0 0.0308 is smaller than 0 0.101. So what does that mean? That means that the silver nitrate is the smaller, is the limiting reagent, so I can report out 0 0.0308 moles of silver chloride. But wait, wait, Mr. Popovich, you didn't turn it into grams first. Anybody have a problem with what I've done so far? I didn't turn it into grams. Do I need to turn it into grams to determine the limiting reagent? No. That was a very drawn out no. <laughs> it was a guess. <laughs> it was a guess. Well, think, well, logic it out with me. How are you going to get grams of AGCL from moles of CL? Moles of You're AGCL. You're going to it by the weight of AGCL. And how are you going to do it here? How are you going to do it? So aren't we multiplying it by the same number? Yeah, so the silver nitrate would still be the smaller. The, the silver nitrate would still be the smaller. So guys, when you get to this stage, you don't have to take it on the gram. If you want to take it on the grams, go for it. God bless you. But you don't have to. At this point, knowing that you have more moles produced from the calcium chloride than you have produced from the silver nitrate, you know that the silver nitrate is going to be the limiting reagent. All you have to do is take the bottom one and multiply that by the molecular weight of silver chloride, and you have your answer. In this case, that weight is 143.32. I end up with 4.40 grams of silver chloride. Are we good, guys? Talk to me. Tell me things you're not understanding. I am good personally. <laughs> Cassidy, Jessica, or was that you, Cassidy? Yeah, that was Cassidy. Uh, Jessica, Jasmina, Gabe. I think that's the whole class today. Is everybody good with this? Yeah, I just good. don't know how to to read the problem and figure out what the heck I'm supposed to be trying to find. Okay. Well, let's look at it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is. Um, I'm sorry. Jasmine, no, not Jasmine, it is Jessica. Jessica. Okay, Jessica. You have, this is the new problem, okay? <clears throat> right? You have ammonium chromate and copper chloride. What doesn't the problem imply that you're going to mix the two together? Jessica. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Okay. When you have these two things together and they ask you what the limiting reagent is, then uh, you have to assume that you're mixing the two together. Okay. So at this point, you got to determine what ammonium chromate is and you got to determine what your copper two chloride, the formulas of both of them. These are the these are the two compounds written together, but they're not balanced, Jessica. I have to balance them now. Okay, let's do the easy one first. Copper two chloride. What's the charge on the copper, Jessica? 
I think it can be plus two or plus. Yeah, no, 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 no. What does this two say it is? Oh, that's not two. an either or. It's a plus two charge. Chlorine, right. chlorine has a? Minus one. So how many, what's the formula of CuCl? CuCl2. Very good. Okay. Now, do you know what the, what the charge is on the chromate? Um, no, I don't think it had a charge. CrO4, yes it does, it's an anion, okay? These are both ionic compounds, Jessica. Ammonium, ammonium is the only polyatomic cation. So whenever you see ammonium, it's going to be an ionic compound. Okay. So NH4 is the cation. The CrO4 is the anion. Now, if NH4 has a plus one charge and CrO4 has a minus two charge, I need to have that balanced. NH4 is a plus one, CrO4 is a minus two. So how many, how many plus ones do I need? I don't, I don't know. Okay, Jessica, what do you have to add minus, what do you have to add two minus two to get zero? I, I don't, what do I have to add two minus two? What, what, what? do you have to add two two minus to get zero? What I'm trying to tell you is the overall charge on the molecule has to be zero. Okay, so if that's true that the overall charge is zero and I know that my negative portion is a negative two, what do I have to add to negative two to get zero? Oh, uh, oh okay, positive two. Positive two. Now, each of these NH4 delivers one positive one. So how many NH4s do I need to get to a positive two? Uh, you need a total of two. Two of them. So when I write that compound out, it's gonna be NH42CrO4 plus CuCl2. Now, the Cu is a plus two, so this one's balanced. The CrO4 is a minus two. And the NH4 is a plus one, and the Cl is a minus one. So everything else is balanced, okay? Now, Jessica, I have two NH4s on this side, correct? Uh, yes. How many do I have on the right side? Just four. No, not four. Oh, NH just one. NH4 is the entire cation. So what do I have to put in front of the NH4Cl? A two. I have to put a two there, okay. I, how many Cu's do I have on both sides? One. Okay, how many CrO4's do I have on both sides? One. How many Cl2's? Remember, there's a two in front of this now. So how many Cl's do I have on both sides? Two. Are we balanced? Yeah. With this, this equation down at the bottom is balanced. All right, so we've gotten our balanced equation. Uh, Ian, you out there, Ian? Wait, 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 yes, I'm here. Okay, Ian, do you know what the first step to doing any stoichiometric problem is? No, if I'm being honest. Okay. First step in any stoichiometric is taking your known values, turning them into known moles. So you're going to take your known grams, turn it into known moles. Now, we were discussing earlier that you recognize a limiting reagent problem by being given two quantities, both quantities of the reactants. So in this case, we have ammonium chromate. We have copper two chloride. So what we are going to do is we are going to 
determine how many moles of ammonium chromate we have and how many moles of copper chloride. Ian, do you know how to do that? No, because this was on the quiz this morning, right? The hard uh, stoichiometry. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I struggled on that. Okay, well, it's, it's not much of a struggle, Ian. How do you get moles from grams? How many moles is it per one gram? Yeah, I have 190.1 grams. How am I going to get the moles of ammonium chloride, chromate from that? Figure how much one mole of ammonium chromate is. And then I'm going to multiply that. Uh, yes, oh, it's I'm a gonna, multiply? Well, it's multiplied by one over. over. Okay. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. And you're dividing by the molecular weight. Same thing with the copper chloride, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's why we are going, we're going to take each reactant, turn it into moles. So if I have 190.1 grams of ammonium chromate, that means I have 1.251 moles of ammonium chromate. If I have 184 grams of copper chloride, that means I have 1.370 moles of copper chloride. Okay, Ian, going through the steps of stoichiometry. The first step is to make moles of known by dividing the grams by the molecular weight. Now, Ian, do you know how to go from moles of your own to moles of your unknown? Not that I remember at the moment. Okay, what we have to do is we have to look at the balanced chemical equation. And we have to realize that we are going to use what's called the molar ratio. We're going to take the moles of our sample of our reactant and compare it to how many moles of the product we would make. So if we choose ammonium chloride, this means for every one mole of ammonium chromate we use up, we make two moles of ammonium chloride. For every one mole of copper two chloride we use up, we make two moles of ammonium chloride. Does that make sense, Ian? Yeah. Okay, now, the thing about the limiting reagent problems is you have to realize that if you're given two amounts, you got to figure out which one is limiting you. We're going to use up all of one, and when we use up all of one, there's not going to be any more of that to react. So that's the definition of the limiting reagent. One of these two will limit the other. The strategy we're using to figure out which one it is, is we are going to compare it. We're going to compare it to how much of the, each one of them makes of one product. Ian, does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay, so I've got this many moles of ammonium chromate. I have this many moles of copper chloride. So I got to figure out how many moles of ammonium chromate, of ammonium chloride, each one is going to make. So I'm going to take my ammonium chromate. I'm going to multiply that by two over one. This gives me the fact that the amount of ammonium chromate I had will make 2.502 moles of ammonium chloride. If I do the same thing with my copper chloride, I make 2.7 moles of ammonium chloride. Now in between 2.74 and 2.502, which one has made the smaller amount of ammonium chloride? 2.502. So what that tells you, Ian, is that this came from the limiting reagent. That's the amount that you report out. Does that okay. make sense to you? Yes. yes. All right. Yes, so all the question asked you is what was the limiting reagent? Correct? Correct. Now, let's go back and be smart. I chose ammonium chloride. Was that the smart choice for me to make? Yes. Well, hmm. 
No, because wouldn't it be easier because there's less of the copper chlorides? Well, if I'm dealing with copper chromates, oh, it brings in an oxygen. It's a one-to-one -one relationship, right? Right. I can just look at the moles of this that I produce, and I know immediately because there's a one-to-one -one for both of them. I know immediately which one is my limiting reagent. So if I want to, if I want to go on. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I'm at here. There we go, there we go. Sorry, there we are. So our last step is to compare which, what moles of product was produced by each and we compare both of them. We choose which one produces the least. In this case, the moles from the ammonium chromate produced the least amount. So that came from our limiting reagent. Okay, again, we're gonna, because, again, we're going to review this all. Stoichiometry, three-step process. Turn grams of known into moles of known by dividing by the molecular weight. Second step, use the balanced chemical reaction to determine the mole ratio between moles of known and moles of unknown use that molar ratio to determine moles of unknown. Then if we're doing the simple process, we take moles of unknown, multiply it by the molecular weight, we have grams of uh, unknown. Are we all good? We're all clear with that now. Ian, do you wish you could take the quiz back again? Okay. Now, we added on to that another thing. It's called limiting reagent. When you do a limiting reagent problem, you're given, you recognize a limiting reagent problem by the fact that you're given two amounts of two reactants. You got to figure out which one is used up first, leaving excess of the other. The way you figure it out is you do the stoichiometry problem for the first reactant, figure out how many moles of product you make. You do the stoichiometric problem for the second reactant, figure out how many moles that makes. Then you compare the two. The one that makes the least amount came from the limiting reagent. That is the one you report out. Are we good guys? Jasmina, I haven't heard from you recently, nor Gabe, nor Cassidy. Yeah, we're good. I'm good. Yeah, okay. I'm good. All right. Is this all making sense, guys? Yeah. All right, I'm going to do one more problem here. <clears throat> you have 1816 grams of oxygen and 604 grams of octane. How many liters of carbon dioxide do you generate at STP? Jasmina, I have STP. Yeah. If I get you moles of carbon dioxide, will you be able to tell me liters? Yes. Absolutely. All I have to do if I have the liters at STP I just have to multiply it by the molar volume, which is 22.414, or excuse me, take one mole over, let me just step down a second. If I have moles of CO2, to turn that into liters, I multiply it by 22.414 liters over one mole. But I gotta figure out which one of these will make the least amount of CO2, so I can take that amount of moles onward. Okay, I'm gonna go with Jessica. What's the first step I do? This is a balanced equation. Jessica, what's the first step I do? Um, take the uh, grams of oxygen and divide it by the molecular weight. Absolutely. Okay. And similarly, what am I going to do to the octane? 
the same thing. You take the the grams, the 604 grams, and divide it by the molecular weight. Okay. Would it make any sense to figure out how much water I'm producing? Probably, but I'm not sure. Okay, you can determine you can use the water to determine the limiting reagent, but you can also do it by choosing carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is eventually what you want to report out. So it only makes sense to figure it out for the carbon dioxide. So we're going to do your first step. So when you're doing a limiting reagent and you see that there is a carbon dioxide in the formula, you just always go with that? No, no. Okay. Look at the question, Jessica. Yeah, it looks like Japanese to me or something. I don't understand it at all. Okay. What, you are, what the problem is telling you is you have... 1,816 grams of oxygen, you're combining that with 604 grams of octane. And the question is saying, how much carbon dioxide do you make? Oh, okay. Does that make yeah. sense to you? Yeah, because it asked it right there. I guess I didn't even read that part. <laughs> so basically, it doesn't make sense to do it through water since they're asking right. you specifically the amount of carbon dioxide. So as you said, Jessica, we are going to, we're going to figure out how many moles of oxygen and how many moles of octane. Uh, Cassidy, Cassidy. Yes. Looking at these numbers, which one's the limiting reagent? The octane. Are you sure? Um, well, that one has 5.29 moles compared to 56. Point seventy five. So, yeah. but have I made moles a product yet? No. Don't I have to do that to determine the limiting yeah. reagent? So Just I'm for kicks and giggles, what do I have to? What's my molar ratio between oxygen and CO two? Oxygen and CO two would be um, sixteen over um, twenty five. So I'm going to multiply my moles of oxygen by sixteen over twenty five. Does everybody see how we got that number? Yes. Okay, Gabe, how, what's the molar ratio of octane? Uh, would it be 25? Of octane. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. It's, it's. Remember, we're trying to figure out moles of carbon dioxide. What's the molar reaction, reaction? What's the molar relationship between octane and carbon dioxide? 25 to 16. That's oxygen to carbon dioxide. Oh, oh, oh. Um, don't you have to convert the 604 grams of octane? We've already done that. I'm asking you right now, what is the molar relationship between octane and carbon dioxide? Is it I don't know, it's a perfectly good answer. Um no, I feel like I know it. I look at the look at the coefficients in front of the two compounds. Yeah. Um two over sixteen. Okay, you have moles of octane. This is why you need to keep your labels, guys. You have moles of octane. If I multiply two moles of octane over 16 moles of carbon dioxide, is that where I want to go? Have I eliminated my moles of octane by multiplying moles of octane by moles of octane? Stay with me, Gabe. I'm like confused now. Okay. What you told me to do, you told me to take moles of octane and multiply it by two moles of octane over 
16 moles of CO2. That's what you told me to do. Gabe? Yeah, yeah. Is this going to work? Mm, no. So, what, do you, what, what number has to be over top of what number? I don't know. Um, so, somebody help him here. The octane has to be on the bottom. Gabe, I have moles of octane on the top here. In order to get rid of it, I need it to be on the bottom. I want to end up with moles of CO2. So that has to be on the top. So in effect, I have to have 16 moles uh, CO2 mm -hmm. over two moles, two moles of octane. octane. Are we good now? Wait, so when it's 16 moles CO2 over two moles of octane, you're trying to get what? You're trying to get the moles of CO2. Oh, moles of CO2. Okay. okay. All right, I think I'm following you. All right. So, uh, who was it? Was it Cassidy that suggested it was octane? Right, Cassidy? Yeah, that was me. Okay. Now, you want to change your opinion? Yes, it's actually going to be oxygen instead. So this is why, guys, I, I, I love this. I love this example because this is why you can't go from just making the moles of reactor. Look at that discrepancy. It's a 10 to 1 ratio of oxygen to octane. You would think with that much in excess that octane has to be the limiting reagent. But lo and behold, when you do the molar ratios, you find out that less CO2 is produced by the oxygen than by the octane. So I have to use the, oct the oxygen because it produced less moles. I'm going to take the 36.32 and multiply it because it's at STP, multiply that by 22.414 liters per mole, that gives me 814 liters of CO2. Are we good, guys? Yes. Are we confused? Come on, guys. I need to know if you're confused about something. Can you go because back one slide? One slide. Thank you. This is where I can use the molar ratios in the balanced chemical equation to figure out how much CO2 I would have produced. Okay, are we good guys? Yes. All right, I've got another problem. Another problem here involving a single replacement reaction goes through the same thing step by step. Are we good with limiting reagent? How much time did I spend on this? What are the ops? What are the possibilities of it being on the test? Quite high. Quite yeah. high. Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to determine percent yield. Percent yields, what you get over what you should have gotten. In other words, what you have done is you have actually done the experiment. You've done the experiment and you have retrieved a certain amount. So that is going to be your experimental value. That is going to go on top. That's the amount you actually got from doing the work. The amount of what you should have got is the amount predicted by stoichiometry. So it's experimental value over stoichiometric prediction times 100. You mix 5.034 grams of sodium phosphate with excess 
nickel two chloride. And you end up with 4.583 grams of sodium chloride. What is the percent yield? Guys, let me see if I have a slideshow. Yeah, good. I, want, I need to do this specifically for a second. I mix, what am I mixing? Just me, what am I mixing together? Uh, sodium phosphate and sodium chloride. Read the problem. What am I mixing with the sodium phosphate? Or is this nickel two chloride? I mix it. You got to read the problems carefully, guys. I'm mixing sodium phosphate with excess nickel two chloride. Okay. So I'm mixing sodium phosphate with nickel two chloride. And I'm obtaining, I've already, I've done the experiment. And this is what of the product I got back. So the 4.583 in my percent yield experiment is going to be the number in the numerator. Now, Jasmina, I reacted it with excess nickel two chloride. Am I dealing with a limiting reagent problem? Yes. I'm reacting it with excess nickel chloride. If I give you that statement, can you say right off the bat, right now, which one is the limiting reagent between sodium phosphate and nickel two chloride? Yeah, I think it's sodium phosphate, right? I have excess nickel two chloride. If I'm giving you the information that I have excess one of the reagents, that means automatically that the other one is the limiting reagent. So all you got to do is use that amount to come up with your theoretical amount of the sodium chloride. Are we doing okay with this, guys? Yes. Does anybody not understand what I just said? I don't. Read, I'm sorry? I don't. Okay, Jessica. You look at the question, specifically the saying that you mix sodium phosphate with nickel chloride. So you know what the two reactants are, okay? okay. The other information that the problem give, gives you is that there's excess nickel two chloride. So I have extra, I have extra nickel two chloride. If I have extra nickel two chloride, then by default, the sodium phosphate has to be the limiting reagent. So this is not a limiting reagent problem because for a couple of things, one of which is I only give you an amount of one of the reactants and I specifically state that the other one is in excess. Now, the other amount that's given, you have to realize that I obtained this much. So after I mixed this with that, I got this much back experimentally. So if I'm dealing with this, the other thing when you're analyzing this problem, if you're trying to do this as a limiting reagent problem, then you're trying to mix sodium phosphate with sodium chloride. Is that gonna do anything? Yay, nay. If you mix sodium phosphate with sodium chloride, is anything going to happen? Yes. What's going to happen? Wait, with sodium chloride or with nickel chloride? With sodium chloride is what I said. Oh. Um, maybe, sodium uh, phosphate plus sodium chloride. I don't know what would happen, actually. Nothing. OK. I was gonna because guess. if you try, I'm sorry, Cassidy. Oh, if no, you try sorry. and mix this as a double replacement reaction, then this sodium would hook up with that phosphate and this sodium would hook up with that chloride and nothing has happened. You start okay. with sodium phosphate and sodium chloride, you end up with sodium phosphate and sodium chloride. Okay. So you can't use these two numbers even if you wanted to. 
Cassidy, you got that? Yeah, I do. Sorry, I was just confused for a second because I didn't know if you meant nickel chloride instead. No, I, I, I said specifically sodium chloride. Because you know what happens, guys? People see this problem and they try and work it as a limiting reagent problem because they see, oh, I got two amounts. But you got to look at the question it's asked. It's a fairly simple question. It's telling me specifically, I mix sodium phosphate with nickel chloride. But it also gave me the extra information that I had excess nickel chloride. So that means that my sodium phosphate has to be my limiting reagent. The other thing analyzing it, even if you wanted to use the sodium phosphate mixed with sodium chloride, nothing's going to happen from that. So first thing we have to do is we got to balance this equation. This is nickel 2 chloride. Somebody shout it out, nickel 2 chloride. What's the formula? Ni2Cl. Is that correct? Nickel 2 chloride. Oh, sorry, no, NiCl2. Sodium phosphate. Na2PO4? PO4 is a minus 3, Na is a plus 1. Na3PO4. Guys, if you're not answering, you should be at least thinking about this. Okay, the Ni was a plus two. It's going to be a plus two on this side. The PO4 is a minus three. What are the subscripts for NiPO4? Ni3PO4, two. Very, PO4 parentheses, two. And how yes. about the NaCl? Uh, NaCl2. What's the charge on Na? Oh, no, NaCl, NaCl. There we go. So that's balanced. And eyes, three on the right, one on the left. Fix it. Put a three in front of the one on the left. And a three, three on the left, one on the right. Fix it. Put three in front of the one on the right. Okay, now, if I do that, if I do what you suggest, that means I have six chlorines on the left. I have three on the right. Fix it. Put a six in front. And at that point, I should be balanced. This is what you just went through and did. So right now, I have my balanced equation. Next, I'm at this point, I'm doing the stoichiometric problem. I'm taking my sodium phosphate, dividing it by my grams. This gives me the moles of sodium phosphate. I get my moles of sodium, or my, take my sodium phosphate, multiply that by six over two. This gives me 0 0.029212 moles of sodium chloride. This is how much sodium chloride I could make. So this is the second step where I go through the molar ratio. Now, if I have that many moles of sodium chloride, how do I get the grams of sodium chloride? You multiply it by, by its molecular mass. I'm going to multiply it by its molecular mass. And I get 5.383. Remember, guys, we're being asked in this, what is the percent yield? Does the 5.383 go on the bottom of the percent yield, or does it go on the top? The bottom. Bottom. It's the, we just went through all this stoichiometric. The stoichiometry product goes on the bottom. Then you got to look back at the problem. The problem said that we got 4.583. So it's what we got over what we should have got. 4.583 divided by 5.383 times 100. This means our percent yield is 85.14%. Questions, guys?
Okay, I'm gonna let you, I got 15 minutes left, guys. I, I wanna get through excess reagent. I wanna start with that. This problem, is this problem a limiting reagent problem? Yes. Yes, it is, because I'm mixing two things, the nickel two chloride and the sodium phosphate. I'm mixing two things, and when I mix those two things, I obtain 1.583 grams of sodium chloride. So, bottom line, change this into moles, change this into moles, figure out the molar ratio, figure out which one produces less of sodium chloride, and that is going to be my percent yield. Are we good, guys? Percent yield, guys. Generally speaking, if I do a problem that's involving reactions, I'm going to give as part of the problem the percent yield. Put down the formula at least. If you have no idea how to do the stoichiometry, at least put down how you get the uh, uh, percent yield. And that's just experimental value over stoichiometric value times 100. And then make up some numbers. If you do that, you will get at least the points for the percent yield. All right. Now, remember I said, remember I said that if the limiting reagents all used up, that means some of the other stuff is left. So what you're going to do when you want a excess reagent problem or a what's left problem, what you're going to do is you're going to determine, you're going to use the limiting reagent to determine how much of the other reagent was used up. Then all you got to do is subtract the moles used in the reaction from the total amount of moles you started with. That will give you the moles of what's left, then convert to grams. Does this make sense to you guys? An excess reagent re problem is going to be an additional thing to doing a limiting reagent problem. All you're going to do is you are going to figure out how much the limiting reagent uses up. Then you are going to subtract the amount that the excess reagent, that the limiting reagent uses up from the excess reagent. And then you are going to convert that to, uh, to by the molecular weight. Cassidy, you're making yes. sandwiches again. All right. Well, you have 30 slices of ham and you have 12 slices of bread. Okay? Okay. You need to put, you need to put three slices of ham in every sandwich. Okay, you have 30 slices of ham, uh, 12 slices of bread. What is my, li what is limiting you to the amount of sandwiches you can make? How many sandwiches can the 30 slices of ham make? The 30 slices of ham can make 10 sandwiches. And the 12 slices of bread? Six. Six. Okay, so I, what's limiting me? The bread. Okay, so if I make six sandwiches, how many slices of ham does that use up? Um, 18 slices. How many did I start with? 30. So how many do I have left? 12. This is exactly what we're doing in the excess reagent problems. Okay, we have a balanced, we have a balanced equation up there. We have that much nickel and that much sodium phosphate. How much of the reagent 
in excess is left. Okay, pick one. You got to pick one. So in this case, I'm going to use my nickel chloride. You have to, you have to pick one or the other. I'm going to use my nickel chloride to see how many moles of my sodium phosphate I'll use up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my nickel chloride, turn it into moles, and I'm going to take the amount of sodium phosphate and turn that into moles of sodium phosphate. Now by my problem, I know if I start with nickel chloride, I use up two moles of sodium phosphate for every three moles of nickel chloride. So if I start off with this amount of nickel chloride, I've used up two over three amount of sodium phosphate. So I take my moles of nickel chloride, multiply it by two over three. This means I will have used up 0 0.01046 moles of sodium phosphate. At this point, you have to ask, do you have that much sodium phosphate? This is how much I had originally. That's how much I used up. I had 0 0.01053 originally. I used up 0 0.01046 moles of it. Do I have enough sodium phosphate? Yes. I have enough sodium phosphate. If I have enough sodium phosphate, that means it's in excess and the nickel chloride must be the limiting reagent. Remember I told you I would show you another way to figure out limiting reagent? Guys, if it is confusing you, then don't use this particular problem to figure out limiting reagent. Okay. When I figured this out, this is the amount of sodium phosphate I used up. But how much did it start with? I started with 0 0.01053. So if I used up this much and I started with this much, guys, how much is left? How do I get how much is left? Subtract. Subtract, yeah. I have 0 0.0007 moles left. In order to determine the amount of grams, I have to multiply it by 163.94 grams, because that's the molecular weight of it, times the 0 0.0007 moles. Uh, I didn't do the math here, dear guys. I can do that real quick, but It's point one one four seven five eight. Point one has to be point one because that limits you to sig figs, guys. Okay. Is this making sense to you? Yes. Yeah, for the most part. Okay, work through it. If you're having trouble with this. I would definitely go to the video. I think the organic tutor, I use the organic tutor for this. If you're having trouble with this, I would look through the PowerPoint because pretty much guys, I do these step by step in the PowerPoint. So I would look through the PowerPoint first to see if that clears it up. If that doesn't work, go to the video I have in the online outline. Understand, guys, this is not the only way to do to solve the problem. Okay. 
If I started out, these are my original moles of nickel chloride and sodium phosphate. I do the two molar ratios. Which one is limiting? The, Which one's limiting? NAC oh. Where did the NaCl yeah. come from? This or uh, this? Come on, guys, the smaller moles. Which one, what, which one did it come, come from? Nickel chloride. So this means that this is the amount of product I could have produced, correct? Yes. Yeah. So if this is the amount of product I could have produced, I use that to go backwards to see how much sodium phosphate. I could have gotten. That is the amount that would have been produced from the Na3PO4. I subtract the amount used in reaction. This gives me the amount. I don't like this. Don't forget these two slides, okay? Let's try another problem. I've got 343 grams of lead four nitrate and 182 grams of ammonium chloride. How much of the remaining reagent is left? Jasmina, what am I going to do? Pick one, pick one, Jasmina. Do you want to start with the lead nitrate or the aluminum chloride? The aluminum chloride. Okay. I think you wanted to choose the lead nitrate. Yes, I did. Okay. Okay. So if I have this much lead nitrate, I divide by the molecular weight. This gives me the moles of lead nitrate. Now, once I have the moles of lead nitrate, how much aluminum chloride did I use up, Jasmina? What's the ratio? Four to three. So I'm going to multiply my lead nitrate by four over three. And this gives me the fact that I needed 1.00 moles of aluminum chloride. Did I have it, Jasmina? I did the molar calculation of what I started with for aluminum chloride below that. If I need yeah. just mean a one mole of aluminum chloride to react with 0.753 moles of lead nitrate, do I have enough? Uh, we got to understand what's happening here. I have my weight of lead nitrate. I produced moles of lead nitrate. I then multiplied it by the molar ratio of aluminum chloride over lead nitrate, and I got 1.00 moles of aluminum chloride. What this means to you is if I have 343 grams of lead nitrate, I need to react to all of this, I need one mole of aluminum chloride. So the next thing I do is I find out the aluminum chloride I have which is I have 1.37 moles of aluminum chloride on hand. Do I have enough, Jasmina? I need one. I have 1.37. Yeah. I have enough on hand. That means that my lead nitrate is, in, is the limiting reagent. So I have 1.37. I used 1.00. How, much, how many moles are left? 0 0.37. 0 0.37. I mean, 37. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, I would have gone with that, 0 0.37. I would, I, would, I would agree with that. So yeah, the only thing I have to do then is multiply the amount of moles in excess by the molecular weight. This gives me 49 grams of aluminum chloride left. Guys, I think we're at the end of our time. 
Anybody have any questions? I think uh, this is the end of the stoichiometric section. I think what I want you to do, well, let me see if I have anything more. Okay, I have one more problem. Please, because I'm at the end of time, I can't really go through this with you. Please look through this last statement because both of the problems I did before, the one I chose, the one I chose to do was the limiting reagent. And this problem, and sorry, this last problem, please go through this because the one I chose is the excess reagent. And there's another couple of little nuances. Unless you're willing, unless you're willing to stay behind. Do you want to stay the extra five, 10 minutes or not? I have class in 10 minutes. I, I, I'm sorry, is it Ian? I'm sorry, Ian. Oh no, it's Gabriel. <laughs> Gabriel, I'm sorry, Gabe. No, it's fine. Uh, that's, it's your choice. Do you want to go through it on your own? I'll stay. I can stay. I can stay. I can stay as well. Okay. Gabe, stay. As, I know you have to go to another class. I'm sorry. Please, please pull up the Zoom meeting. I will get that online uh, hopefully sometime today. All right? All right. I'll look at it. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Okay. In this reaction, I have 47 grams of sulfuric acid and 33 grams of aluminum hydroxide. How much excess reagent do I have? Okay, in this case, I chose the aluminum hydroxide. The uh, uh, molecular weight of aluminum hydroxide is 78 grams. I get 0 0.42 moles of aluminum hydroxide. Now, in order to figure out how much sulfuric acid I need, I have to take my aluminum hydroxide moles and multiply it by the molar ratio of three over two. This means I need 0.63 moles of sulfuric acid. Do I have it? This is what I need. I need 0.63. How many do I have? 0.48. Do I have enough? No. That means that the sulfuric acid is the limiting reagent. Okay? Before, when we asked that question and there was enough, it was an easy process. All you had to do was just subtract how much you used up from the amount you had in the excess. Easy process, right? Guys? Yeah. Now this is going to involve a little more work. I don't have enough. So that means that my sulfuric acid is not the excess. My aluminum hydroxide is. So if you get to this point and you've chosen the wrong one, guys, you got to start from scratch again. You got to figure out how much the 0.363 moles of H2SO4 will use up of your aluminum hydroxide. So I go from the 0.48 moles of sulfuric acid. I use up two moles of aluminum hydroxide for every three. This means I will have used up 0.32 moles of aluminum hydroxide. I started, remember guys, let me go back here. I started with 0.42. I used up 0.32. So at this point, I used up 3.2. I had 4.42. This means I have 0.14 left. I simply multiply that by my grams per mole, and that is how much aluminum hydroxide is left. It's not that much, that's not that big a deal, but it just is a little nuance that I kind of wanted to show you. And yeah, 
That's how much is in excess. Any questions, guys? Can you move to the slide before this one? Certainly. The one before that one, my bad. Thank you. Is this kind of making a little sense, guys? Yeah, I think so. It's, you're going to need to do a lot of problems with it, guys. You will need to do a lot of problems with this. Uh, the more you work at this, the better you become. I know some of you are having troubles balancing the chemicals and balancing the equations. You really have to get that stuff down. This is chemistry, guys. Things are going to build on other things. And eventually, we're going to use this to apply to Hess's law in a couple weeks down the road. Guys, if you don't have any more questions, I did keep you about five minutes over. I am sorry about that. It's all right. I, Thank you for showing that last one. Hey, I'm, I'm here to serve you guys. What did the guy used to say in Princess Bride? That's going to drive me crazy now. What did Wesley used to say to... As you wish. Yes, thank you very much. As that. you wish, ladies and gentlemen. It's much appreciated. I have a stats professor that only posts videos from the textbook and lectures from the textbook and doesn't do Zoom. So it's nice not having to teach myself a class. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's... This is what's driving me crazy, guys. I have a good sense of each one of you. I do have a good sense of, every, of everybody that attends the Zoom meeting. Not as good as I would if it was face-to-face, -face, but I do have a sense of this. And it's certain uh, people that don't come to the Zoom meetings, I have no idea. I have no idea what they're understanding, what they're not understanding. And literally speaking, I have a feeling that once they get to thermodynamics, there's going to be a huge wake-up call. And I think I'm going to have a lot better attendance at that point. Anyway, thank you all for being here. Have a great day. I will see you on Thursday where we're going to get into solutions and acid bases. I have a question, but not related to the PowerPoint. I notebooks. hopped in late on the meeting. Yeah, the notebook. Okay. Oh, and uh, another thing. On the quiz yesterday, I had a question on the bread problem. I okay. took a picture of it. Uh, I'll go through it. With I, anybody else, does anybody else have anything else? No, thank you very much, Professor. My pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Okay. Is this Ian? Yes. Okay, Ian. I'm going to hopefully get... I got to figure out where it's at, though. It's not that, definitely not that. It's I can read name. off the problem. It, it wasn't a hard one. It didn't require work. It was nope, we're good. We're good. Bread and ham. Okay. Uh, you, are you seeing this? my screen? Yes. Okay. First of all, don't, while I'm waiting for this to wind up, don't worry about the notebook. Okay. Okay. What I'm going to what I what I always do, Ian, is uh -huh. I focus on one notebook during the semester. If I can teach you how to do one, I will have taught you how to do it. Okay. At that point, it's up to you whether or not you continue to do it. Okay. Because it's my own personal belief that a notebook is your own personal thing. Okay. So as a, as a consequence of that, I need, to, you to, I need you to demonstrate that you've been able to do it once. Once you're able to do it once, then it's cool from there. Okay. So I will go back and regrade everything is what I'm trying to say. You show me how you, you show me you can do it once, I'll go back and regrade everything. All right. And now is that just signing across the printed out lab book? No, 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 no. It has to do the first day of class when I was going through orientation. If uh -huh. you went through the Zoom meeting with me. I might have missed that one. 
uh, what happened, and unfortunately, it didn't get recorded. I think I was having trouble with, uh, uh, I, know, I know exactly what happened, Ian. Uh -huh. I, ha I have to wait a half an hour after these uh, lecture meetings. I have to wait a half an hour for the lecture to be recorded. Okay. okay to it to be converted. If I right. don't wait that half an hour period and I try and start a Zoom meeting right on top of it, what happens is that Zoom meeting doesn't get recorded. Okay. So that's why I've been waiting a half an hour from my 5.30 lecture to, to do the lab. It's, I, I have to wait that half an hour to get the lecture recorded so I can then record the lab. Well, what happened okay. is that first meeting didn't get recorded. I thought it was recorded and because it didn't get recorded where I described the notebook wasn't available to you. Does that make sense to you? Yes. So that's, that's what happened. And then unfortunately I didn't get a chance to look at the notebooks until like this past weekend. All right. Which quiz is it? Eight? Uh, the hard stoichiometric problems. I, th seven. Yeah, I think it's eight. Or no, it's seven. seven. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go in and we're going to try and pull it up. Okay, so um, which question is it? Question six. Okay. It, 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 it seems so easy. I don't, under, like, I don't know how I got it wrong. Because okay. I know it wasn't supposed to be 12 slices. I thought it was supposed to be two slices of bread left over. Okay, how many slices? All right, you're making sandwiches. How many slices of bread are you going to use up? Uh, how many Two sandwiches? Per. How many sandwiches can you make from twenty? Ten. How, if you, uh, and then eight three slices, three slices of ham. ham per. So there are, how many slices of ham do you? Uh, how many sandwiches can you make from the ham? Eight. You can make eight from the ham. Ten from the bread. So what's limiting you? It would be the bread. Oh, wait, no, it would be the ham. The ham. So I can make eight sandwiches, right? Right. So if I can make eight sandwiches. Oh, you're missing two whole sandwiches, which is four slices. Oh, that makes go. so much sense. Okay. Wow. I spent like a solid 10 minutes trying to figure that out <laughs> last night. I had no idea why I was so confused. I put 12 thinking, okay, it might have been a typo and he meant two slices, but that makes perfect sense now. Okay. Thank you. No problem. And, you know, obviously, Ian, I used it. Uh, this is, again, it's not it really and truly when you think about it, it's not that hard a problem. But I was, oh, no, using, it, I was using it to illustrate the excess reagent thing. Okay, yeah, it makes a lot of sense now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Have I'll a good you. one. You have a good one. Have you, see you on Thursday.